going to start introducing you now. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susie. I'm the film librarian here at the Darien Library, and I'm pleased to welcome back Mark Albertson today to talk about uh, Strong Women in History, Amelia Earhart. As you know, our, our programs here at the library are made possible by your generous donations to our friend, uh, Friends Campaign, and we're able to bring you programs like Mark's and others to uh, help enlighten you, our patrons. So with that, I turn it over to Mark. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. This is um, talk five of five, uh, Strong Women in History. And this one, this uh, good, pretty good way to end up with Amelia Earhart, who had a short but uh, pertinent life. Let's put it that way. She, um, she will only live 39 years, uh, but she left her mark. In fact, it's because of her, uh, in part, that uh, women uh, in World War II will fly aircraft, military aircraft from the United States and Canada across the Atlantic, perhaps stopping in Greenland, Iceland, into Ireland and, and, the, and the British Isles. And uh, for the aircraft to be used by the men, uh, women really didn't get into combat in World War II for the United States. They did in the Soviet Union, but not in the United States. So she had a far reaching effect and interesting too politically, she was a big supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment and she became good friends with such people as Eleanor Roosevelt who really wanted her to teach, uh, Eleanor wanted uh, uh, Amelia to teach her how to fly. Uh, she did go up for a couple or three rides, but, uh, but uh, she never really got to, got to teach uh, Eleanor Roosevelt to fly. Uh, she was actually, she had a sister named, uh, named Muriel. Uh, and so, but they were born, uh, she was born actually on July 24, 1897 in Atchison, Atchison, Kansas. Her father, Samuel Edwin Earhart, and her mother, Amy, uh, Amy, uh, Amy, Amelia, Amy Otis. And uh, she was born in 1897. Her sister, uh, her sister Gloria Muriel, Grace Muriel, pardon me, was born in 1899, and <clears throat> uh, their mother, their mother Amelia or Amy, uh, uh, was pretty free here, allowing the girls to grow up uh, as uh, tomboys. Uh, their grandmother, or Amy's mother, really wasn't a fan of this. But the girls grew up as tomboys and they actually were allowed to wear bloomers. Uh, again, their grandmother didn't think this was ladylike. And, but their mother was pretty far seeing from the perspective that allow the, the, allow the girls to be free thinkers, therefore critical thinkers. These girls would go out and collect various small animals, bugs, they were interested in this. But it usually was Amelia who was the real tomboy and Muriel, actually uh, Grace, Grace Muriel Earhart. She, as they, as they got to be a little older, changed her name. She just wanted to be known as Muriel. She didn't like the name Grace. And so before they're really teenagers, she liked to be called Muriel. Of course, the two girls did have nicknames for each other. Amelia was known as Mill or Millie, and Muriel was known as Pidge. And they carried these nicknames on for quite a while. But it's, it's, uh, it's Muriel, who really who was born in 1899, died in 1998. So she was 99 when she died. Uh, interesting, they are some partially of German descent uh, they are born in the home of their maternal grandfather and Alfred Gideon Otis, who was a former federal judge and president of the Atchison, Kansas Savings Bank. And uh, there was one other child uh, who was born, but stillborn. So it's only the two girls, by the way. Uh, there, there were named for their grandmothers. Uh, the, the this was a family custom. Uh, Amelia Josephine Harris and Mary Wells Patton. And from an early age, uh, Mealy or Millie, and again, Pidge for her sister. 
uh, again, they, they, they were very much tomboys. And, and interestingly enough, they had the money to homeschool the girls. In fact, Amelia will not see a schoolroom until she's 12 years old or seventh grade because of the fact they were homeschooled either by their mother or a governess. Their father, their father uh, worked for the Rock Island Railroad and he will later be transferred from Atchison, Kansas to Des Moines, Iowa. And Ellen, uh, Aunt Amelia Earhart said that she missed moving from her grand, grandmother and grandfather's house because it had a rather voluminous library. And she, even though she was somewhat of a loner, she, used, she was a voracious reader. Interesting, some of these women who were voracious readers, Eleanor Roosevelt was a reader too. Uh, 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 um, Helen Keller, you know, through Braille was, was or being read too, was also uh, one that liked to read or be read too. Interesting little side note here, as far as them being, as far as them being uh, uh, tomboys, they they visited an uncle in St. Louis, and I guess he was as free free with his thinking as as their mother was, and he had a tool shed that had a sloped roof to it, and Amelia Earhart got a hold of a box, and she went on top of the tool shed sat in the box and went down off the roof. And of course they come down with a crash and she gets out of the wreckage and she says to her sister, Pitch, this is fun, it's like flying. Uh, the sh uh, even at this age, and I'm talking like about six or seven, uh, we uh, set, well, seven or eight, uh, we're looking at somebody who's really beginning to think out of the box here. However, uh, the, the family is going to have to move to Des Moines, Iowa. The father goes first because of his new job as a claims agent for the, for the Rock Island Railroad. And so the mother is going back and forth until finally the whole family moves by 1907, 1908. Interesting here at the Des Moines State Fair, uh, you know, the airplane, you know, the, with the Wright brothers having flown if, if you believe that it was the Wright brothers who were the first. The plane is, not, is, is about five years old at this point. And Edwin, their father, was going to uh, take uh, Amelia up for a ride with the pilot. And she took a look at the plane and she said later on it had rusty wire and, and the wood didn't look all that great. And she didn't want to bother. She didn't want to bother at all. And and interesting here too, um, was that when the, when the and, and so that was the end of her first attempted experience at flying was really f sailing off her off her uncle's off her uncle's roof of a, of this tool shed, but she didn't want to fly in that airplane. Uh, she by you know her father, um, her father takes to drinking. And this is where the family fortunes are eventually going to come to an end. Uh, not being in their grandparents' house anymore, uh, she winds up in, in, a, in a public school in seventh grade. She's 12 years old, Amelia does. And with the and the interesting here, the, the, even though he's beginning to, to start drinking, the family finances weren't all that bad at this point because they even have two servants at this juncture talking 1909, 1910, until finally it gets to the point where her, fa where her father uh, is drinking so much that he can't function. And so he loses his job uh, with the Rock Island Railroad. He tries to get another job with the Great Northern Railway in St. Paul, Minnesota. And he does for a short period of time. And she enters the Central High School as a junior there. We're going back to 1915 now. And her father is not doing too well at his job. You know, he's trying to overcome drinking. He did lay off for a while, but she is not doing as well in school. You know, and interesting here, 
she went to uh, she went to Chicago, and interesting in the 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 going to Chicago, she winds up going to Hyde Park High School, and so you know how you know how um, cruel sometimes children can be, teenagers, so on and so forth. In her book, in her yearbook, uh, they wrote in 1916. Here is a uh, uh, here is A E, the girl in brown who walks alone. Hmm. You know her mother and father are eventually going to separate. Not a divorce, not yet. Separate. She winds up going to the the Ogun School in Riddell, Pennsylvania. It's a junior college, and from there, uh, she takes time off and she goes to Toronto. In the Chris, uh, for Christmas vacation in 1917. Her sister, uh, Muriel, is already in Toronto. Her sister at this point is a nurse and she's working at the Spadina Military Hospital. And Amelia will volunteer as a nurse assistant, you know, assistant nurse, whatever the case may be. And it's here that she begins to see modern war and what it does and what it does to the soldiers the the horrible wounds from modern industrialized war but while and she stays here for a while you know she doesn't go back to school she stays here and she's becoming interested in medicine she's becoming interested in medicine one problem though in fact two problems number one in no, October, November, 1918, she contracts pneumonia. And on top of that, maxillary sinusitis, which she has a severe, now severe sinus condition. And she's gonna be laid up in hospital for two months, for two months. And the pneumonia eventually go away. Not so the sinus condition. The sinus condition she has puts terrible pressure on her eye, one of her eyes is 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 periodically in pain. Uh, you know, it's not like modern medicine today. She's she's draining through her nose and down her throat. And the operations, the first operations, do not really do such a great job in alleviating this problem. And so she's going to have chronic sinusitis on and off for a number of years here. In fact, even when she started flying, there were times when she would wear a kerchief or a handkerchief to hide the, the, the drainage tube on her face. And so, so she's going to go to Massachusetts for a year. Her sister had moved to Massachusetts, so she goes to Massachusetts, Northampton. She has to recuperate, 1918 going into 1919. And here she she gets involved in reading poetry. She learns how to play a banjo and she studies mechanics on her own. At this point too, uh, in 1919, she prepares to go to Smith College, changes her mind. She enrolls in Columbia University and one of the, in a course of study for her, medical studies. That's what she intends she wants to do. However, she quit in 1920 and ventures out to California. Her mother and father have made amends here, at least for now, and she goes out to California. Now, keep in mind, her grandmother had died, and uh, her, her mother's mother, and her mother's mother left the inheritance, left the inheritance in Amelia's mother's name, because she was afraid that if Edwin had been a co, a co on on that on that in that will, he would have drank up all the money. So the inheritance that they have, it's not huge, but they do have a modest inheritance to fall back on if it's required. So she goes to California, and on December 28, 1920, they are at the Long Beach Fair. And at the fair, there's an airfield nearby, and Frank Hawks is flying. Frank Hawks, Frank Hawks is um, 
is a fly is a is a well-known flyer and he will become a champion stunt and race pilot and and he's also offering rides this day and this time she takes the ride and she goes up and she later said when the plane was two or three hundred feet off the ground i now knew what i wanted to do for the rest of my life so now she wants to fly and but that takes money she will get a little bit of money from her mother however she puts in she puts in hours working as a stenographer for a local phone service in Cal in this in, in near long beach she also uh is, she also becomes a photographer you know this is a lady who as well as a truck driver <laughs> this is a lady who in high school uh, you know when she was in began in school and in high school kept a scrapbook and in the scrapbook were ladies who made their marks in in, in initiatives dominated by men interesting photography could be politics uh sports uh any great things that women did especially especially in endeavors dominated by men she held in high esteem and she had the scrapbook well she's not going to be denied flying and so she gets a job as a stenographer at a phone company uh she's taking uh, photos photographer and she's also driving a truck she needs a thousand dollars and she goes to in in, J in late january 19 1921 uh to see an anita snook or Nita Snook, they used to call her Nita, but uh, Anita Snook. Anita Snook was one of the was one of the pioneers of of uh, of, of women pilots. And Ellen, and uh, Amelia goes up to her and says, "Will you teach me? I want to learn how to fly. Will you teach me?" So now she's beginning to take lessons from Anita Snook, and to show you how determined she is. Uh, the the ride or the journey to get to the airfield, she had to take the bus to the end of the line, and then she walked more than three miles to the airfield to take her lessons. She also bought a yellow, uh, also bought a leather jacket. The leather jacket she understood is that insignia of a pilot, and so when she bought the bought the leather jacket, she slept in it for three nights to give it that wrinkled or worn look that many pilots have. She's also gonna cut her hair because many female pilots in this era had short cropped hair. So she cuts her hair. I mean, she's really getting into the ambiance of being a pilot. She, she will later, you know, when, when, when she's able to get her, or get her, uh, get her license she buys a plane a yellow plane an air an air an airster kingster uh, kister kister airster and in that plane she calls it the canary and in that plane on october 22 1922 she will set an all-time record at this point an altitude record for female pilots at 14,000 feet she also has, by the way, uh, that she's the 16th woman to get a pilot's license from the Federation Aeronautique uh, Internationale. She's the 16th woman. License number was 6017. However, at this point, her mother, and she buys another plane, by the way, so she has two planes. However, at this point, her mother and father, you know, her father goes back to drinking and, and, her, and her mother and father can't stay together, so they get divorced. She at one point wanted to go back to school. But now the, with the, you know, and, and, the, and the inheritance, they finally ran out. So she has to sell her two airplanes. Now she has no planes. She has to sell her two airplanes. She buys a car. Her and her mother, are going to drive from California 
to Massachusetts. However, they take a side job, they take a, a little side trip to Banff, Alberta, and they take this convoluted journey to get to Massachusetts. Uh, they, she finally winds up, interesting here, she wants to enroll and she has a problem with her sinus again. Uh, and so she'll have an operation. This operation is a bit more successful and it helps to overcome a lot of the ramifications of this sinus infection. But she never really will totally be, uh, she will never totally be void of, 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 of this sinus infection. So it's gonna afflict her for most of the rest of her life. However, she is, on a, she is on a, in a better place right now with that sinus infection. However, she wanted to return to Columbia University, uh, but she can't because of the fact, not enough money. And so she begins to uh, offer her services as a teacher, uh, as a social worker. And at this time she lives in, Den she lives in Medford, Massachusetts. And as a social worker in 1925, she works, she works at Denison House. However, her interest in aviation is growing stronger to the extent that she becomes a member of the American Aeronautical Society, the Boston chapter. She's also writing articles for local newspapers and periodicals on the benefits of flying and especially the woman's point of view, getting women, trying to get women into being interested into aviation. Uh, she also flew, for, first flies again out of, De she's the first one to fly out of Denison Airport, which later becomes the Naval Air Station Squantum uh, in Quincy, Massachusetts. And however, she helps to, she also becomes a sales rep for Kinner Aircraft out of Boston. And and as she and, as she, and, and her articles are making her a local celebrity, and of course, in nine, this is 1927. The following, and she's beginning to fly again. She's flying, but at the same time, she's writing. However, in 1928 or 1927, Lindbergh crosses the Atlantic. Of course, this is a earth-shaking event here. Someone finally, someone finally made it across the Atlantic. Others tried it, and others weren't so successful. Uh, many, uh, some people lost their lives. Some World War II, World War One aces tried, and a, and, and there was the, the French uh, lost. One of the French aces lost their lives. He lost his life trying to cross the Atlantic. Well. Lindbergh makes it, Lucky Lindy. In 1928, Amy Guest, who was a female aviator, was asked to, fly, asked to take part in another flight across the Atlantic. She'd be the first lady to fly. She turns it down. She said that, you know, she said that perhaps someone younger and someone with more of a name should make the flight. And so, interestingly enough, on, in April 1928, Amelia Earhart got a phone call from a Captain Hilton H. Raley, who asked her, would you like to cross the Atlantic? Now, she, she's going to take part in this juncture with two other, two other flyers, men, Wilmer Stultz and, Lew, and, Lewis, and Lewis Gordon, who Stultz will fly the plane, and the co-pilot mechanic will be Gordon. She is to keep the flight log, although later she said, all I was was like, a, was ballast. She says, I was like a bag of potatoes for, for weight. But she will cross the Atlantic. However, her future husband is one of the promoters of this uh, agenda, George Palmer Putnam, the publisher. And we're gonna get into that in just a couple of minutes. They will leave Newfoundland, New Trespassy Flan, uh, Newfoundland, on June 17, 1928. And they will land at, so uh, at, at Bury Point, South Wales, 20 hours and 40 minutes later. There's a commemorative plaque now for this flight. 
They received a rousing welcome June 19, 1928, when they continued when they landed at uh, Southampton, England. Here, Amelia flew a plane, an Avro Avian, owned by Lady Mary Heath, who who Amelia is now going to purchase this plane, and it will be shipped back to the United States. But however, when they when the three of them get home, they are going to get the ticker tape parade in the in the Canyon of Heroes in Manhattan. And they will be given a reception at the White House by President Calvin Coolidge. She now has that celebrity image. She now is now, you know, uh, Lindbergh was known as Lucky Lindy. She's now known as Lady Lindy. Many, many see her, you know, uh, at a distance, her tall, slender build, looking a little bit like Lindy. Uh, maybe as her sister, as his, as as her as as Lindy's sister, uh, that's not the case, and not even related. However, George Palmer Putnam is doing his job. He's really pump priming this lady as a celebrity to the extent, to the extent, uh, you know, the the uh, the, uh, the the luggage appears, uh, a clothing line appears. You know how it is with athletes and actors, right? Well, that's what's happening to this lady in 1928, 1929. She's now becoming a, a top bill, a top billing here, personality. So the, the clothing line appears in places like Macy's. Uh, so does the luggage line. Interesting. A.E. Remember what I mentioned earlier about her day in high school. A.E. The woman who walks, the woman in, the girl in brown who walks alone. And well, now those initials now are becoming uh, etched, uh, etched on the public mind. If you want luggage, ladies' clothes, and the ladies' clothes are patterned for her build. So what do you think happens here? A lot of ladies who have her build are going to go out and buy these clothes. Of course, they could, could have been a man, too, if Lindy had his own clothing line. They're supposed to be wrinkle-proof clothes. She also becomes an associate editor at Cosmopolitan Magazine. And, in, and she's also now a big personality in pushing aviation itself. Uh, with Lindbergh, with Lindbergh, she becomes involved in, tra in trans transcontinental air transport, TAT, which later becomes TWA. Uh, she's also invested time and money, interestingly enough, in setting up the first regional shuttle service between New York and Washington, D.C., called the Ludington Airline. Uh, she was vice president of National Airways, which conducted flying, uh, flying uh, operations from, for, for uh, overseeing the Boston Maine Airways, which was another one of these regional airlines. And by 1940, this had become Northeast Airlines. Uh, however, there's, there's another personality in this, Gore Vidal. Gore Vidal knew Amelia Earhart when he was a, when he was a young boy. His father, his father, Jean Vidal, uh, was General Jean Vidal at one point, one of the early army aviators in American history. And he became good friends with Amelia Earhart. You know, after a while, when, when she married, and we're going to get into the, we're going to get into the, um, the marriage here between her and George Palmer Putnam, uh, that marriage became a wretched marriage uh, with with uh, George Palmer Putnam kindly, uh, constantly trying to keep her in the limelight. She actually supposedly, according to Gore Vidal, uh, had a soft spot for Jean Vidal. And, you know, she supposedly wanted to get, leave George Palmer Putnam and put in with Jean Vidal. Jean, uh, General Jean Vidal told her, uh, I like you. He thought he was a good friend, but I don't love you. And so she will persist in this wretched marriage. And Gore Vidal also said he was on a train one time with her going to New York City uh, with, with a group. But they, they were sitting together, you know, and he's only he's only at this point 11, 12 years old. And this was the planning of the round the world flight. And they had a map out and Gore Vidal is sitting there 
with Amelia Earhart with this map. And he says, well, Africa, Africa here looks pretty dangerous. I mean, you go down in that jungle, uh, you know, uh, or no, he said, he said the Pacific, look at that ocean. Look at that ocean. I mean, it's wide open. You, 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 if you go down there, how are they going to find you? And she says, well, there's a lot of ships going back and forth. But she said the African jungle would be the most dangerous trip because if you went down in the jungle, how are they going to find you? Well, what's going to happen here? And later on, after the war, Gore Vidal talking to, he got to know very well uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Of course, he called her Mrs. Roosevelt. And he, he asked her, he says, what do you think about, what do you think about the story about uh, your husband, Franklin D as the president sending Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, sending Amelia Earhart uh, in through the Pacific, flying across the Pacific to spy on Japanese possessions. And Eleanor told him in no uncertain terms, well, as you might expect, I did my, I had my own investigation done, and that's just not true. Well, that's from Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. But she, and, and, and so, Gore, and so uh, General Jean Vidal was also involved in the Ludington, uh, putting together the Ludington line, the trans air continental transports, which became TWA, so on and so forth. And so, however, uh, she's still flying. She's still, she's still marketing her pilot skills. And in 1930, interestingly enough, uh, Earhart became an official national aeronautic, uh, became an official of the National Aeronautic Association. And she also promoted an establishment of separate air, air, uh, air records by, set by women. And flying a Pitcairn, uh, Auto gyro. She set an altitude record in 1931 of 18,415 feet. I don't know how many here are, are 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 familiar with an auto gyro. It's a small plane, had stubby wings, and it had a propeller behind the cockpit, and it had a propeller. It was it was an it was an airplane, but it had another propeller on the top. And unlike a helicopter, it's not a helicopter, unlike a helicopter, the, the auto gyro had a, it couldn't just take off vertically and land vertically. It had, it had a short runway takeoff and that helicopter, that, that helicopter propeller would help lift it off the ground quicker than a normal aircraft. The Marine Corps tried that for military uh, as a ground support aircraft in Nicaragua when they were in there during the late 20s, early 30s, it didn't work out. The auto gyro will eventually just die out, not the helicopter. The helicopter, you know, today, the military uses them quite well. But the auto gyro, she set an, she set an altitude record of 18,415 feet with an auto gyro. Uh, during this, she also helped form the 99s, a women's flying group. And she also gets involved in fly in flying races, the women's der derby, which the women's air derby, which Will Rogers later called the Powder Puff Derby. However, her marriage to George Palmer Putnam, she was engaged at one point to a Samuel Chapman, a chemical engineer from Boston, but she broke off that engagement. Now keep in mind, George Palmer Putnam the big book publisher who was also involved in, in pumping this lady publicly uh, asked, asked um, Amelia Earhart to, uh, to marry him six times, six times. She finally said yes. Now he already had two boys from a previous marriage. He was married to a Dorothy Binney. Now this is, must've been an interesting marriage. She was the heiress to the Binney, to the, to the, to the Binney Smith Company which invented Crayola crayons. Uh, it was a big chemical company. They had two boys, David, uh, who, was, who, was, um, who was born in 1913, died in 1992, and George Palmer Putnam Jr., who was born 1921, died 2013. David Binney Putnam was actually an explorer and a writer. And after, 
George Sr. and George Sr. And, uh, and, and, and Amelia got married, she became good friends with, with David, George Sr.'s oldest son. Uh, they became really good friends. But they had a home in Rye, New York, at the Apollamas Club in New York. And um, of course, George, George Jr., the youngest boy, contracted polio, like Franklin D. Roosevelt did. Uh, however, in 1932, May 20, 1932, Amelia Earhart, who's now 34, uh, took off from Grace Harbor, Newfoundland, with a copy of the Telegraph Journal given to her by our journalist named Stuart Truman. This was, this was to solidify the date. And she flew, and she intended to fly to Paris with a Lockheed Vega. And she did, she flew, actually, she flew to Ireland and she landed just north of Derry Island, Ireland. And there's two farmers there. And she made the crossing in 14 hours and 56 minutes, not bad. And there were two farmers there. And they said, well, who are you and where'd you come from? She said, I came from the United States. So she was the first woman to fly the Atlantic nonstop. And of course, the French are going to give her a medal, the Legion of Honor, the French government. She also got the gold medal from the National Geographic Society, which was given to her by Herbert Hoover. That's his last year in office, by the way, the depression is raging at this point. Uh, again, her friendship with, uh, she, she also was, will, will, you know, her friendship with um, Eleanor Roosevelt. At one point when uh, the Roosevelts get into the White House, in 1933, the, there, there's a story that used to float around Washington that Eleanor, uh, that Amelia Earhart slept at the White House. And the, these, you know, first ladies can't do this anymore. But the two of them, Amelia Earhart and Eleanor Roosevelt, got all gussied up and snuck out of the White House for a night on the town. Uh, you, you, they, you, the first ladies can't do this anymore. <laughs> those, those, those days are gone. But interestingly enough here, this rocky marriage she had with George Palmer Putnam, uh, probably at the very beginning here, even before they tied the knot, the day they got married, George Palmer Putnam, there was a note for him. And, he, and he, well, you know, the bride and groom are supposed to meet, on, uh, see each other prior to, the, prior to exchanging their vows, right? And there's a note for him. So he picks it up and reads it. It's from his betrothed. Don't think I am going to be, I am going to adhere to any middle medieval conventions on marriage. And I expect the same from you. Oh, and by the way, I am not Mrs. Putnam. I'm Amelia Earhart. That's the note she sent. Now, the journal, the, print, the reporters are going to get a hold of this. And every time they called her Mrs. Putnam, she'd just smile. I'm Amelia Earhart. However, George Palmer Putnam, they became, and he didn't appreciate this too much, they began to call him Mr. Earhart. So they reversed the roles here. However, her career is really, as we should call it, taking off. In 1935, January 11 to be exact, she became the first aviator to fly solo from Honolulu, Hawaii to Oakland, California. On April 19, on April 19, she flew from Los Angeles to Mexico City. And then on May 8, she took off from Mexico City and flew to New York. And so she's increasing, she's increasing her, 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 her lore here, her legacy here with all these flights. She did fly in the Bendix Trophy race and she finished fifth. However, in, um, it's also at this point where now she's making all these records that they have to move, they're going to move, her and George Palmer Putnam are going to move to California. They actually had a fire at the house. And they're going to move to uh, Holly, North Hollywood. And she's actually uh, speaking uh, in, in, in California when, she's, uh, when a man steps up and introduces himself. Paul Mance, who, uh, 
who is a Hollywood stunt pilot. And he also has a flying school. And because she's getting more into long distance flying, he, they will create a partnership here. And, and so with the Putnams, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Putnam moving to California, she now becomes close to also Paul Mance. Paul Mance had a long career as a, as a noted stunt pilot. In fact, uh, it's, it's, it's Paul Mance's uh, business that did a lot of the stunt work for uh, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Uh, Frank Tallman was another one that flew with him. And uh, the, he was another noted stunt pilot uh, for Hollywood as well. But they have a flying school. And so now she has that going with going for her, as well as continuing to fly. However, it is at this point, uh, she's also on the faculty of Purdue University as a visiting faculty member to counsel women in their careers and a technical advisor at their department of aeronautics. And it is here that they begin to plan the round the world flight. Early in 1936, they begin to plan that. And the flight is to be 29,000 miles. And with financing, part of the financing came from Purdue University. And she has a Lockheed Electra 10E built at the Lockheed company, built to her specifications. And it included uh, extensive modifications to the fuselage to incorporate a larger fuel tank. For a flight like this, she's going to need a larger fuel tank. It's a twin engine monoplane, metal. Uh, it's a flying laboratory. And it's actually going to be hangered not far from the Lockheed plant at Paul Mance's United Air, Air Services, which is just across the airfield from, from, uh, from Lockheed's Burbank, California plant. And she begins to put together a crew. Paul Mance will be one of them. Another one is Harry Manning. Harry Manning was the, was the captain of the ship, President Roosevelt, that brought Amelia home after the first time she crossed the Atlantic with Wilmer Stoltz and Lewis Gordon. He is not only a, he is not only a, um, a merchant mariner captain, he's also an aerial navigator, quite a fella. Another one is, another one, Fred Noonan. Fred Noonan, who will be the man on the ill-fated flight with her, keep in mind there were, there were two attempts at this, not just one, there were two attempts. Fred Noonan uh, was also an acknowledged, not only aerial navigator, but also an acknowledged ship captain and maritime navigator. In fact, it is Fred Noonan who put together a lot of the air routes, a lot of the air routes for uh, Pan, the Pan Am Clipper in the Pacific. So this is the crew she puts together. And the first attempt to do this round the world flight uh, was March 17, 1937. Only they're going east to west. In other words, they left California for Hawaii. That was the first leg. Now, the way this was supposed to run uh, Harry Manning was actually supposed to be the navigator from Hawaii, Hawaii to part of that Pacific leg. Fred Noonan would also be a navigator across the rest of the Pacific. However, when they, when they take off from California and they land in Hawaii, pardon me, there's going to be a problem here. When they go to take off, to continue the journey from Hawaii. Some people thought a tire blew. Um, uh, Paul Mance was not on the plane. He was, he was gonna fly from California to Hawaii and that was it. However, some thought it, a tire blew. Amelia Earhart at first thought maybe the landing, a landing gear collapsed. Paul Mance said it was pilot error. 
whatever the case was, the wing touched the ground and the plane crashed into the ground. They can't continue the flight. The plane has to be taken back to California to be repaired. And so the plane will be taken back to California. However, this time, when they do that, when they make the second attempt, it will be just Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan. And they're not, they're gonna go from the West Coast now east. They're not gonna go back across the Pacific first. They are going east. Now, they, they, the plane is fixed up, it's all repaired and ready to go. On June 1, 1937, they leave California. And, and so they cross the United States to Florida. And from there, they will begin that flight down to South America, across the South Atlantic to Africa. And finally, they will get to, uh, you know, they go to the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, and they finally wind up in Lai, New Guinea. Now that was June 29, 1937. Out of 29,000 miles, they have now flown 22,000 miles. And they made it over the African jungle, which was a fear that she had. So now, so now they've got two of the legs to go here. And they are supposed to leave Lai New Guinea, Lai New Guinea on July 2nd, 1937 for a Howland Island. From there, from Howland, they're supposed to go to Honolulu, Hawaii, and then from Honolulu to Oakland, California. That's the end of the journey. And the thing here is the, 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 the journey, from, the leg from Lai, Lai New Guinea to Howland Island, is 2,556 miles. It's the longest leg of the journey. The one problem here, they take off at midnight, July 2nd, 1937. There was a aerial for, for their electronic equipment on the bottom of the plane. It was a loop antenna. Supposedly that loop antenna was damaged or ripped off. Some say it was ripped off. The, the, the airfield at Lai New Guinea was not a hard surfaced airfield. It was turf. And so with a full, full, uh, full, full tanks of fuel, that plane is bouncing. Now, supposedly it ripped that loop antenna off. Some, some took a look, they never found the antenna. Another problem that's later gonna show up later on, uh, the loop, loop antenna, which is a wire. And this wire is on a spool. And as you're flying, you crank out the wire so that it trails the aircraft. That's your radio communications. Apparently, either Fred Noonan or Amelia Earhart cut some of the wire because they got sick of, of cranking out the wire. And to me, why would you do that for? Why would you do that? And so, and so their communications, I, it could be that that helped to upset their communications as they're flying. However, waiting at Howland Island is a Coast Guard cutter, the Itasca. Leo Ballarts is the radio operator. Now, supposedly they're, they're you know, they're, 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 they're flying towards Howland Island. And as they get as they get near, they're supposedly near Howland Island, you know, some of the transmissions were fine. Some of the transmissions were fine because Ballard said so. But as they got closer, uh, some of the transmissions he's getting, some of the transmissions he's not. There's one problem here. The Itasca uses Navy communication systems. They are not using Navy communication systems on the plane. So he's not getting everything he should get. Some comes through crackle, some of the messages he's not getting, some come through clear as a bell. However, there are other people who are also hearing some of the messages, like maybe Pan Am, other other you know other rate other receiving stations on other islands that that are, that are getting these messages. But Ballard, but Leo Ballard is not getting anything, and as he as, as getting all these communications, and as he said, he he said I sweated blood 
trying to get her plane to come into Howland Island. Now, Howland Island is only at its highest point, 10 feet high. It's not a big island. You know, there are no big, there are no real super tall trees. There are no real hills here as landmarks. So Ballard's is gonna keep his key open so they can home in on, on, his, on, his, on his frequency. Now, interesting here too, at 6.14 a.m., he receives a call. We're only 200 miles away. And they, the, the, the plane re, 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 uh, requests a direction finding, direction finding. So he keeps, on the, he keeps the signal, so it's a continual signal that they can home in on. However, at 7.42 a.m., uh, Amelia radios, we must be on you, but can't see you. And the gas is running low have been unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at a thousand feet. Her 758 AM transmission said she couldn't hear the Atasca and asked them to send voice signals so that they could try to take a radio bearing. This transmission was reported by the Atasca as the loudest possible, as the loudest possible signal, indicating Earhart and Noonan were in the immediate area. So what are they going to do? They're going to fire up the boilers, create a smoke, a smoke signal, so to speak. The last known transmission was 8.43 a.m. We are online, 157.337. We will repeat this message. We will repeat this on 6210 kilocycles. Wait, however, a few moments later, she was back on the same frequency, which was her original frequency, 3105 kilohertz. And we are running on a line north to south. Not, you know, not west to east here. We're not doing that. And so her transmissions are becoming weaker. And so who knows where she is at this point? Does she know where she is at this point? Now there was another island about 300, 333, 330 miles south, south southeast of, um, of Holland Island, Gardner Island. Although that hadn't been a, an, a inhabited according to, the, the, according to the Navy searchers for 40 years. And, and all of a sudden the, the, the transmissions are no longer being made. Nobody knows what happened to her at this point. The last one was 8.43 a.m. AM. Some think that she might have crash landed near Gardner Island, about 330, 330, 330 miles south, southeast of Howland Island. You know, the plane could have sank in the lagoon and they could have made it ashore. But a, 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 a search of the island doesn't seem to say this. Doesn't seem to say this. Also, there, there, were, there were stories about her being shot down by the Japanese. There were also stories about her winding up on Saipan in the Marianas. That's many miles to the north. That's many miles to the north. How'd they get there? There was that photograph, supposedly, of her, a distant shot of her. But they were supposedly shot both of them by the Japanese as spies. Another, but, but the search efforts, you know, the Itasca steamed around, couldn't find her. Uh, there was a search launched by the Navy with the battleship Colorado and the aircraft carrier Lexington. That search cost the Navy department $4 million. Doesn't sound like a lot of money today. It was back then and it was the most expensive sea search up to that time. 1937. The Japanese, the Japanese even launched the search, search, search two ships, search a quadrant of 150,000 square miles and couldn't find her. Nobody knows exactly what happened to her. Now, George Palmer Putnam, you know, uh, George Palmer Putnam uh, thinks that maybe she crashed. Her, her, her stepson, David, made the comment, they're 17, 18,000 feet down, you're not gonna find them. Another noted 
aerial expert said at this point, meaning into the 21st century, he made this remark, it was around 2004, 2005, you know, an airplane's not like a ship, that plane's, oh, practically all that plane's dissolved by now, the salt water did its work, how are you going to find them? How are you going to find them? Another story had it that she became one of the ladies that was Tokyo Rose beaming that poison to the United to the, the servicemen in the Pacific. Oh, that is. Another one is a book that was written in the 1960s into the 1970s. And that book on the story of Amelia Earhart, <laughs> uh, interesting here, this book uh, by a Joe Class wrote this book on Amelia Earhart. There was a lady who was a banker in New York who looked, who supposedly looked like Amelia Earhart. And Joe Class said that this lady who was a banker was Amelia Earhart. She went into hiding. This lady swore up and down she was not Amelia Earhart. And she took Joe Class and the publisher to court. That publisher was, ran, was, I believe, Random House. That's a big name. She won a million and a half dollars and the book was yanked. But no one knows today with any degree of certainty what actually happened to her. And so Gore Vidal, as a young lad, when he mentioned it, he thought, as a young lad looking at the looking at the vastness of the Pacific Ocean as that most dangerous part of the route, you know, 11, 12 year old boy pro was proven to be correct, despite the circumstances, was proven to be correct. George Palmer Putnam was able to get his wife, life, wife declared dead in 1941. You know, it, it usually a seven year period, he got it done within three or four years. So he could claim the luggage and clothing line, take some of that money and launch search, searches in the Pacific himself. But they never really found, they haven't found a body. They haven't, they, they, ha they also haven't, um, you also haven't found the plane you know, they haven't found really anything. All they have are bits and pieces. And so the, the big thing here about, about Amelia Earhart, one of the really big things about her is not what she accomplished. It's that there's no closure. Even today, that story is very popular. In fact, there was a movie made in 1943. Um, it wasn't Ruth Roman. I'm trying to remember who who was the lady flyer. And Fred McMurray was had the who was not Fred Newton. They, they they took the characters and the plane was lost. So they made a movie about this in 1943. Uh, I, I think it might have been Warner Brothers that made the movie. But to this day, nobody knows with a degree of certainty what actually happened to them. Uh, Amelia Earhart and Fred Newton. So probably David, David uh, Putnam, David Bernie Putnam, George Palmer Putnam's oldest son was probably right. They're 18,000 feet down and no, one, and no one will ever find out at this stage. Uh, I think it was Paul Mance that said, Amelia Earhart did not do her due, dil du due diligence with the radio communications. He also said that when they were, when she was getting ready, she should have been better prepared before she even left the first time. And he didn't think she was. But, you know, um, but uh, uh, Leo Ballard said uh, that he was having problems picking her up but but to me too why would you cut i don't know how you know not be you know if, if, if even even though even though i do historical research at an aviation army aviation magazine 
Uh, but I, I didn't get into the really get into that. We don't do Amelia Earhart, but at the same time, having known, you know, and this is interesting, the crank aerial, you know, that yeah. was done in World War One, and you know, in World War One, uh, when you know when when they're beginning to put together air forces, they had pusher and puller planes. In other words, if the if the propellers in the right. nose of the plane, right. it's a puller. If you have a prop in the back of the plane, it's a pusher. And some of these planes were pushers. In fact, some of the reconnaissance planes or even bombers, you would have somebody in a open, open cockpit tub with a machine gun to protect the plane from the front. And so the propeller was in the back. However, they quickly understood that if you're gonna have a crank area, you, the, the co-pilot would actually, or the, or the radio operator would actually crank mm -hmm. this, this spool and a wire would be let go into the slipstream. And right. that's how you sent your messages. Right. However, if you have a pusher propeller, that's not going to work. But they used that for quite a number of years. And so to increase, so for the so for the the aerial, you crank out and you let because it goes into the slipstream. Mm -hmm. You let the aerial out, the wire out, and then when you're done transmitting or receiving, you just crank the wire back up. Well, what's the big deal here? And and that and that's I mean some of the stories though uh, that. <laughs> are outlandish like her being to one of the to one of the ladies who was tokyo rose i mean give me a break uh but the the movie that i brought up earlier was called flight for freedom and it was made during the war 1943 and it starred rosalind russell and that kind of, and this is interesting this furthered the myth that air that Earhart was spying on the japanese and so that helped perpetuate that myth too but right. Eleanor Roosevelt swore up and down that no, my husband never did send her to spy on the Japanese. You know, so where do we go with that one? You know, so it's interesting the stories that because there's no closure here. Whenever there's no closure, all the people are going to start the stories here. Right, right. You know that always happens. But but they did find they did find bones on on Gardner Island, but it wasn't wasn't Earhart yeah. because because if she had crash landed in the lagoon, the plane would have sunk. They could have they could have swam or even walked to Gardner Island. Mm. But apparently, according to the Navy, when they went there and searched Gardner Island, they found that there hadn't been anybody there for forty years. There there was a ship sunk right off the shore. But nobody had been there for 40 years. And Howland Island is, is just really a spit in the Pacific. You know, it's, it's not even, it's about 10, it's 10, the highest point is 10 feet above sea level. So there are no real, no, there are no real tall uh, uh, obstacles for to home, to home in on really. I mean, it's just a spit really is what it is. But it did have a level plane to land a plane on. But uh, it worked out the way it did. So, but I mean, as advanced as we are here at this point, 1936, 1937, over what they were doing in World War I, uh, it's still not today. <laughs> it's still not today. So trying to find somebody is, it was tougher. You don't have cell phones then. All you got to do is open the phone and leave the key on. Didn't happen. So, you know, Ethel, it's interesting you said about um, advertising. And this is the era. This is the era. Go back to 1922, 1923, when Edward Bernays opened up the first office of, of advertising in New York. Public relations. And he helped channel American opinion in World War I to support the war. And so he's thinking, what can I do with these techniques in peacetime? And he's the one, he's the one, uh, one of the few men who more than, or more than any other, uh, got Americans to buy not what they need, but what they want. So you get somebody like a George Palmer Putnam who, who owns a publishing company, one of the biggest publishing houses then, uh, knows how to knows how to front somebody 
to get something done. And he fronted, he fronted a, a, Amelia Earhart very well here. He knew how to popular, popularize her. And as she's doing these, re, uh, uh, doing these flying records, you know, the, the clothing line, uh, the, the luggage line, uh, and, and, other, ever other, and all other paraphernalia. I mean, they're mirroring what's happening today with certain actors, actresses, athletes, so on and so forth. So yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's, that, but, but, not, but not knowing what really happened to her adds to the mystery. I mean, it really does. It adds to the mystery. You know, there's no closure here. Like with the other ladies we talked about, well, they we know what happened to them, but not this one, not this one. So the stories are gonna start, and and they and they keep going, they keep going. So interesting. Her one of her good friends, uh, Jack, Jacqueline Cochran, who you know it, it, who was a who was a pretty fair female aviator in her own right in this era. And they used to build her up as a rival to Amelia Earhart. And she was another pioneer. And she went through the interesting what she thinks another pioneering aviator was one of Earhart's friends, made a post-war search. She did a post-war search of files in Japan and was convinced that the Japanese were not, repeat, were not responsible for her disappearance. That was Jacqueline Cochran. She did that after the war. So maybe that knocks the Japanese out. Okay, then what happened to her? We still don't know. But maybe David Putnam, George Palmer Putnam's oldest son was correct. Ah, the two of them are 18,000 feet down. I mean, the Pacific is deep. <laughs> I mean, there are areas with the, 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 the Marianas Trench is what, 36,000 feet down? That's deeper than Mount Everest is tall. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of water. But, you know, in other areas of the Pacific, yeah, 15, 18, 20, 25,000 feet. Yeah. Yeah. So are they ever going to find them? Don't hold your breath. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we you know an airplane compared to a ship, you know, a ship has a large, by comparison, a large signature. We're talking a ship like the Bismarck, the Titanic, that kind of thing. Uh, they even found the Yorktown sunk off of Midway. Now that's deep. That's deep. But are they ever going to be able to get it up? Probably not. I don't think so. I don't think so. And it might, and, and I don't, I forgot how many feet down it is. Are they able to going to get down to it? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, the Bismarck they can get down to. I think they've done that. The Titanic they've been down to. I mean, they even had uh, National Geographic, I think, even had TV specials on that one. You know the Titanic, which which is an interesting story anyway, but um, but there are places in the Pacific that are so deep. Uh, you know, we it seems like it. Uh, you know, when I when I listen to scientists, I could be wrong, but it seems like we know more about outer space than we do the own the uh, the bottom of the ocean here, and so. Trying to hunt for um, Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan, that's like a proverbial needle in a haystack. No, no. But I think that one uh, searcher is right. That plane is probably dissolved by now. You know, it's not a ship. It's probably dissolved by now. Try finding even a part of it. You know. So. And that plane wasn't made to float either. It's tough. It's tough. But that's one of the allures of Amelia Earhart. Her, there's no closure. But, but the, the extension of Amelia Earhart is these ladies that flew the Atlantic, bringing those planes, flying those planes to the guys who needed them. 
in the European theater of war. I mean, you had a lot of ladies doing that. A lot of ladies doing that. So that's kind of a legacy of Amelia and, and the others too, like, like, uh, like uh, Jacqueline Cochran and Anita Snook, that kind of thing. Uh, these ladies, these are the these are the ladies who who move on with with aviation, uh, but they did they performed a very significant function. The men are needed at the front, so who's going to fly the planes to across the Atlantic? Many of them, women, women. So, kind of a legacy here. And now, what do you see today? Army aviation. You got women flying Apache attack helicopters. I mean, you don't have to be a muscle man to pull a trigger here. So, interesting. Mark? Yes. Thank you for a wonderful talk today. Oh, it's a lot of fun. She, she's an interesting, she's an interesting character. Yeah. She really is. And I, but I always find part of the, uh, part of that thing that really uh, sells me on Amelia Earhart is how she was growing up. You know, A. E. The young, the 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 girl that a uh, girl and the girl in brown who walks, who walks alone. I mean, what an indictment at this point of her age. I mean, that that's that's fascinating. And she didn't go to school. I mean, she was homeschooled, but she doesn't sit in a class until she's 12 years old. I mean, that's a culture change here. Your mother's not schooling you anymore, or the governess, or the governess isn't. Now I have to sit in a classroom. And so when most other children have been in a classroom, not her, first time. First time. In fact, when she was going to high school in Chicago, when they, when they, when the first the separation here between her mother and her father, her mother actually took the time to find a high school in Chicago uh, that had a good science curriculum. And the first one she went to, she said, "I'm not going here." The, the, the she says the lab isn't big, isn't isn't too much bigger than the than the sink. So. She finally found a high school, and then that because she knew her daughter was interested in in science, and later medicine. She had a wide variety of interests: outdoors, science, medicine, whatever the case. Of course, she settles on aviation, so mechanical engineering. She had a wide variety of interests. She's interesting from that perspective alone, and she was no dumbbell. Pretty smart. Pretty smart cookie. She was, of course, when it came to the radio communications, maybe it was a little weak there, but so, but it is what it is. And it wound up the way it wound up. Too bad. You can imagine what she would have done with aviation in World War II. And I'm sure, thinking ahead, I'm sure, I'm sure the army would have given her some sort of and that's interesting because no one ever talks about it, but that'd be interesting if the army had ever given her some sort of command of these ladies flying these planes. I'm just thinking out loud here. Maybe they wouldn't have, but then maybe they would have. You know, who knows? Because you had women in uniform. So, but it doesn't happen. So, anyway, wow. unless somebody else has a Thoughts or questions? That's about it, I guess. All right. I don't see any. I, don't see. I see. Thank you for this presentation. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for taking part. <laughs> Someone just said here, it's a sad story. Yeah, it is. It is. In the end, yes. Yes, it is. Oh, what's this? I don't believe she forgot the life raft. She left it behind with other items for weight. Well, you know, I, I mentioned when I mentioned they took off from Lay New Guinea, uh, and it wasn't a hard airfield, it was turf. And of course, on a hard air, on a soft field, you know, the plane is going to bounce a little bit. And there were, and again, there were people who said, well, the loop antenna on the bottom was broken off, but they never found it. Maybe it was damaged. 
keep in mind they took off at midnight you think you think some people's eyes are really good at midnight here no i don't think so i don't think so but we don't know because now we don't have the plane so all these mysteries all these mysteries yeah i mean it, it, it really it's one of the ones i've always wondered about I'm, you know yeah it's fascinating yeah so with that, I will say, Mark, thank you so much for today. You're welcome. Thank you. And look forward to the next time we have a, a talk with you. Yes. And everyone stay well. All right. So with that, I say good night. Good night, everybody. Have a good day. Take care now. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.